Um, I'm just looking at this title now, Your, Your Future Nephew, but as I was reading over my notes today, I thought a uh, better title might have been Several Weddings and a Funeral. But um, I'll leave it to the listener to uh, count all the marriages and then to spot the funeral when it appears. In 1740, the court of Versailles posted orders to its ambassador in Vienna, Charles Pierre Gaston Francois de Mirepoix, ordering him to now work to forward the interests of Charles Godfrey de la Tour d'Auvergne, Duc de Bouillon, whose wife, Maria Carolina, had been engaged in a legal struggle regarding her father's inheritance with her brother-in-law, James Francis Edward Stuart, known to his supporters as King James III of Great Britain and Ireland and his enemies as the Pretender. Upon receipt of this news, Mirepoix informs the papal nuncio who was partly in charge of handling James's affairs. The nuncio then advised the French ambassador to tell James's own agent, Count Owen O'Rourke, as both his friend and the uncle of Mirepoix's wife. I'll return to this story in the final part of this paper. Before I do so, I wish to draw attention to the relationship between Mr. O'Rourke and Mr. Mirepoix. The nuncio, in writing his report to the Vatican, describes them as relatives and friends. They had both married into the same family. O'Rourke had done so in 1709 and Mirepoix in 1739. This family, the Beauvau, were members of the nobility of the Duchy of Lorraine. The Beauvau family originated in Aquitaine and came to Lorraine in the service of René of Anjou from whence they strengthened the lineage of their family through marital alliances with the families of the Lorraine nobility. The Beauvau would continue to strengthen their family through marriage in the 18th century, and as shall be seen and alluded to, with members such as O'Rourke and Mirepoix in Vienna, they maintained links with Austria, but also with Versailles through Mirepoix, and Rome, where James Stuart resided, through O'Rourke. Furthermore, another in-law of this family, the Marquis de Stanville, acted as the Duke of Lorraine's envoy at Versailles. So as we can see, the family had very strong connections to two of Europe's most import important courts, and they also had links to James Stuart in Rome, and through James Stuart, they have a link to the Vatican. Tonight, I'd like to illustrate these connections, but with specific emphasis on O'Rourke and Mirepoix first half of this paper will explain the background and activities of O'Rourke and his relationship to the Beauvau family and their transnational or transaulic network. The second part will introduce Mirepoix and lastly the third and final part details the court case alluded to at the very beginning that involved both O'Rourke and Mirepoix on seemingly opposite sides. Due to the very piecemeal nature of the archival evidence in Nancy, Paris, London and Vienna, O'Rourke's early life would appear to be rather difficult to trace. He died in Vienna on 4th January 1743, with the city newspaper, the Wienerisch Diarium, noting his age as being 82. This would therefore put his date of birth as having been in or around the year 1660. We would know almost nothing about his family but for a certificate that was drawn up at the Stuart Court in exile in 1708. His father's family, the certificate claims, were in turn the heirs and possessors of the estate of Cara and other lands in the county of Leitrim in the province of Connacht in northwest Ireland. This certificate does appear to be corroborated by a genealogical tree outlined in the 17th century manuscript known as the O'Cleary Book of Genealogies. The main genealogy provided here ends with an individual who appears to be O'Rourke's grandfather though a continuation is included in a 17th century script, which includes the following names, Owen, Tighe, and Brian. The latter two would appear to be O'Rourke's brothers, at least one of whom was with him in Lorraine in the 1700s, for James would express his condolences on the death of a sibling, of O'Rourke's sibling, in 1719. In Ireland in the 1650s, political and social upheaval had seen the old Gaelic nobility largely reduced to tenants on their former estates. The Act of Settlement of 1662 ensured that while a number of Catholic nobles 
consolidated their positions as land holders, many others slipped even further down the social ladder into the ranks of the minor gentry. This depreciated social status and economic power is also similar to experiences in Europe where nobles could find themselves leading lives not too dissimilar to the peasantry. According to the Down survey, in 1670, either O'Rourke's father or grandfather still held a portion of the family estate in Northwestern Ireland. In 1690, branches of the family were still prominent enough that they were able to form two regiments and fought on the Jacobite side in the Williamite War, where O'Rourke served as a lieutenant colonel. After the Treaty of Limerick in 1691, he then departed with the Stuart Army to France, serving in the regiment of Limerick in Italy and the Rhine until 1697. Thereafter, he entered the service of Duke Leopold of Lorraine. He had gained enough prominence in the Duke's service by 1709 that he married a Lorrainer noblewoman named Catherine Diane de Beauvau. Her brother, Mark, had served with Duke Leopold of Lorraine in the Imperial Army during the Great Turkish War, and he would ultimately become Leopold's court favorite. Further adding to that relationship was the fact that Marc de Beauvacron's wife, Anne Marguerite de Lineville, was Leopold's mistress. The mother of Leopold's wife, Catley, wrote that when Madame Cron entered a room, the Duke's face changes. As long as she is not there, he is anxious and always looks towards the door. As for O'Rourke, when he proposed marriage to a member of the Beauvau family in 1709, he found himself out of ducal favor, largely by the efforts of his intended bride's brother, Marc de Beauvacron. Catherine Diane had already been married and widowed twice. Her first husband had been Anne-Francois Jacques, Marquis de Besson Pierre, with whom she had at least three children, the most prominent being their daughter, Francois Louise de Besson Pierre. After the death of Besson Pierre, her next husband was the 70 year old Charles Francois de Stainville, the Comte de Couvange, the Councillor of State to Leopold and the Ducal Envoy to Paris, who had negotiated Leopold's marriage. Couvange himself died in 1706. Now widowed, Catherine Diane appears to have been a rather formidable woman engaged in court cases regarding the estates of her husbands. The nobility's idea of marriage was that it should obtain strong and influential connections for the family and also bring with it economic bounty, that is money. In the world of the Beauvau family, distinguished marital unions with other distinguished families were what was sought after. At which point O'Rourke proposed marriage is unclear, but the sources would suggest this took place around mid to late 1708. Mark Beauvacron wrote that, and I quote, what raises us against this ridiculous project is the well-founded suspicion that we have against his nobility. Indeed, some appearance is that a man who gives himself to be of a distinguished condition has aged in a regiment of infantry without being able during 15 years to acquire the rank of captain. For the last 10 years he has lived in Lorraine. We have known him to have no other relatives than another bodyguard of his Royal Highness, Leopold." Unquote. O'Rourke would declare to the Duke that it was a misfortune to be a stranger. Yet on the other hand, an examination of the area of foreigners who had followed the Duke's court reveals a wider trend of marriage and integration with both the Lorrainer nobility and bourgeoisie. Cron's letter is telling and reveals a family aware of the problems of association with someone of a known background and deeply troubled by a mesalliance. And I quote, you know as well and better than I in England and Ireland, the vassals often take the name of their Lord and the servants as of their masters or godfathers. So whatever, whatever the name may be of an illustrious family, it does not follow that those who bear it are of the same family. I let her to Monsieur de Charmel, their uncle, and his eloquence, armed with all the power he has always had over her, has only been whitening. Her mother's remonstrances have been useless. The presence of her children, whom she has seen at her uncle's home, did not touch her. I have found in the protection that His Royal Highness has granted me on this occasion remedies which ought to put an end to this fine passion. He has made her say that if she would continue on, he would deprive her of her apartment at court or to the gift that he had made her of Morley, the estate, and that he would deprive her lover of his majority. 
and to prevent an incartade, he sent him to Paris, unquote. While it's quite common for a nobleman to marry a woman who was seen to be below his station in order, in order to secure a portion of her family's wealth, for a noble woman to marry below her was less common, though these unions could also prove beneficial and allow the husband to don his new wife's status. Cron clearly believed O'Rourke to be an imposter, not an uncommon possibility in an early modern Europe obsessed with false identities and that individuals might not be what they claimed. Some of the Irish arriving on the continent may have been able to trace their roots to the Gaelic nobility, but the issue was that in the 16th century there had been two systems of nobility. The Gaelic Irish followed a system by which only the head of a noble family held status, while there was also an English system based upon titles granted by the crown. The introduction of surrender and regrant in Ireland by the English government intended to make Gaelic lords bend the knee, led to the redefining of what it meant to be noble. And while it did lead to members of the Gaelic nobility taking titles from the crown, many others did not do so. What is more, the Gaelic Irish did not see the need for the noble born to, to require titles to be considered as such, preferring to emphasize noble char characteristics and disposition. In December and January of 1709, O'Rourke appears in Paris Irish migrants who began arriving in Europe in the late 17th and early 18th century and who sought acceptance and entry into the social circles of their resident nobilities often relied upon the influence and testimony of more influential relatives, patrons and friends who could apparently vouch for their ancient lineage. This was often carried out by uh, obtaining a declaration de noblesse from the Stuart Court in exile then in Paris. The process was carried out by a James Terry, the Athlone Herald, who charged a fee to be persuaded to present a, a request to the Stuart Court, and then charged a second fee once the Secretary of State agreed to prepare a certificate to show to the King. The certificate was submitted by O'Rourke to James Terry and was used to obtain another certificate in order to persuade the actual Court Secretary, Sir David Nairn, to submit O'Rourke's request for a declaration. Having secured this, O'Rourke wrote to Leopold. There do not seem to be any sources which give us a hint of what happened once Leopold received this letter. However, what we can be certain of is that O'Rourke did marry Catherine Diane de Beauvau and that he did return to Lorraine. The pair were, were married in Paris and a marriage contract was signed on 29th April 1709. O'Rourke, though a captain and chamberlain at the Ducal Court, had little significant influence or wealth. The wedding did not sit well with the bride's family, and it was not until 1711 that the O'Rourke's appear to have been reconciled with them. There does not appear to be any surviving direct correspondence between O'Rourke and his wife, which hampers any attempt to identify the relationship between them. Either way, it is clear that O'Rourke's marriage would be exceedingly beneficial in terms of both material wealth and influence. In 1713, the O'Rourke's purchased a house. The estate of Catherine Diane's second husband, Couvange, had accumulated a, an uncollected annuity of 27,000 francs, paid to him by the state between 1698 and 1711, years after his death. After O'Rourke married Catherine Diane, he obtained a decree from the Council of Finance in Lorraine, allowing him to claim the money. The 27,000 francs that had gathered under Couvange's name were then put towards a house in the new district of Nancy, outside the old medieval district of the city, and following the receipt of the final 14,000 francs, the house officially became O'Rourke's by decree on 14th of January. In 1727, O'Rourke departed Lorraine to enter the service of James Stuart as his diplomatic agent in Vienna. O'Rourke and Cron, his brother-in-law, maintained correspondence and supported one another and their interests in various ways. Although there is no known surviving correspondence between the two from this time, we know from their letters to others that they were engaged in these activities. O'Rourke, writing to Cron, spoke of his desire for a cousin to spend some months in Paris, who then informed Madame de Rourke's son-in-law, François-Joseph de Chaucel, Marquis de Stanville, the Lorrainer ambassador in Paris. 
Cron in turn wrote to O'Rourke to know who to address both his sons to so they could be presented to James III when they visited Rome. O'Rourke was also entrusted with forwarding Cron's letters to the Imperial Chancellor in Vienna. Cron had long been promised membership of the Order of the Golden Fleece, and when he failed to obtain the honour in December 1731, O'Rourke was the one who approached the Chancellor of the Order to have the promise honoured. It was not until 1736 that Cron obtained the honour after the intervention of the Duke of Lorraine, and Cron's eldest son was also made Chamberlain to the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles VI. However, O'Rourke was not above criticising Cron, and once wrote that he was so weak a prince and so disordered in his affairs, while in, an, in another instance he deemed him the slightest friend on earth. The terms friend and friendship will reappear throughout this paper. As a concept, friendship has evolved through history to possess the connotations it now holds today. Before the late 18th century, emotionally based friendship was an unfamiliar concept. A, a person described as a friend could be someone upon whom one depended for some form of help. From the 16th to as late as the 18th century, familial relationships were often the main source from which friendships stemmed. Sharon Kettering, in describing the role of kinship in early modern friendship, wrote that it was the chief form of personal relationship in early modern Europe. Kinsmen voluntarily provided assistance from family, affection, loyalty, duty, and the need to maintain honor, while its reciprocity was voluntary, not obligatory, because participants were already joined by permanent ties of blood or marriage. Further extending this family network is Catherine Diane's son-in-law, Stanville, in Paris, who was also in contact with O'Rourke when the situation required it. Attempting to further the interests of a cousin in 1729, O'Rourke wrote to Stanville's secretary in Paris to request that they bring the young man to Versailles from time to time to further his education and cultivation as a gentleman, and that they might find a place for him in the Regiment de Clare. In closing his letter, O'Rourke divulges a piece of intrigue from Vienna relating to British and Austrian diplomacy and the prospect that Britain might abandon its alliance with France with O'Rourke stating, expect me not to tell you at random, you will make use of this as you judge proper. How common it was for O'Rourke and Stanville to disclose other similar pieces of court intrigue is a mystery, as there is no further known surviving correspondence between them. One might suspect, however, that it was not an uncommon occurrence based on O'Rourke's letter. For Stanville's interest, O'Rourke could be a channel to contact Lorrainers in Vienna without the Duke of Lorraine knowing. Duke Leopold had died in 1729 and had been replaced with his son, Francis Stephen, who disapproved of a marriage project between his sister, Elizabeth Therese, and a member of the Court of Versailles in 1729, despite the enthusiasm of their mother. Stanville, whose sympathies lay with the French, had been at the center of this endeavor and was to endure the most of Francis Stephen's displeasure. Thereafter, he went behind the new Duke's back and began secretly directing letters to O'Rourke to Lorrainers in Vienna. These letters were mistakenly delivered to Jacques Mann, Francis Stevens' Lorrainer envoy, who then sent them to O'Rourke's house. Elizabeth Charlotte, Francis Stevens' mother, was instructed to keep Stanville out of private matters thereafter. The, pro the marriage project, as you can guess, never went ahead. In turn, when a cousin of O'Rourke's killed another officer in a duel in the regiment of Dillon in 1732, it was Stanville who solicited a pardon for the young man. Stanville, Stanville would later be asked to represent the interests of James's men in Tuscany following the succession of the Duke of Lorraine to that duchy in 1737. Charles Pierre Gaston François de Mirepoix has often been described in very unflattering terms. The Oxford Companion to Food, in discussing the Mirepoix sauce, to which the Marquis gave his name, quotes a 19th century source, and essentially describes the fellow as an incompetent and mediocre individual. Nonetheless, insofar as we are concerned with Mirepoix, his credentials seem quite impressive. 
his embassy to Vienna alone was an impressive affair. Viennese diplomats were of two ranks, first class, which were ambassadors, and second class, which were envoys, agents, and other lesser titled positions. The kings of France, Spain, and Portugal, and the Republic of Venice were the only ones who had officially recognized ambassadors in Vienna. Born in 1702, Mirepoix was commissioned in the French army in 1733 and fought in the War of the Polish Succession. He had married Gabrielle Henriette Bernard, the, daughter, the granddaughter of the financier Samuel Bernard, Comte de Coubert, in 1733 and received the dowry of 800,000 livres. This marriage ended in 1736 with the death of Madame at age 15. He was made French ambassador to Vienna in 1737, the first ambassador, French ambassador there since 1733. As French ambassador, he was in receipt of a salary of 60,000 livres. At some point, Mirepoix became involved with the daughter of Cron. Cron's wife, having been the mistress of Duke Leopold, when they had their second daughter, Anne Marguerite de Beauvoir-Cron, she was believed to be Leopold's child. Therefore, when she was of an age to marry, a husband was needed who would be of a suitable rank to marry the child of a prince. Anne Marguerite was married to Jacques-Henri de Lorraine, Prince de Lexan, and Leopold's cousin. Lexan had fought and wounded his mother-in-law's brother in a duel over a number of taunts exchanged at the dinner table in June 1723. In 1734, Lixan engaged in another duel with the Duke de Richelieu, in which he himself was killed and he left his wife a widow. Mirepoix arrived in Vienna in January 1738. The British ambassador, Thomas Robinson, who saw him in June, wrote that Mirepoix has much the air of a Frenchman of quality and has very, but was very new to his job, although his commission, character, and nation would ensure he was successful. Mirepoix met O'Rourke within two days of his arrival in Vienna, and the Marquis, with great civility and compliments, received him expressing hopes to enter into a friendship. And I quote O'Rourke, I was indeed something astonished at these extraordinary caresses at first sight, and as I have been told beforehand, that he inquired after me and expressed a desire to see me. I could conclude nothing else from this kind reception, but that his instructions were particularly favorable to your majesty, that is James, his cause. Though in point of politics, I found his carriage to me a little too open for this mysterious place. He engaged me to dine with him, and after dinner took me into his closet, where after some slight questions on the manner of living here, he made a preamble to engage me to be his friend in a secret with which he was to trust me, and on which depended the happiness of his life. And what should this be but a love secret? Mirepoix's attempt at marriage appears to have been romantic, for Mirepoix was in receipt of an annuity of 20,000 livres from his first wife's family on the condition that he did not remarry. As one commentator from Versailles noted in 1738, Madame de Lixan was not rich. The prince and Madame Cron would not allow it, would not allow the marriage, wishing to preserve their daughter's pension of 24,000 livres, and at her behest, O'Rourke was approached. Agreeing to do what he could, he was cautious and wished to avoid any difficulty should the Marquis's civility attract unwanted attention and draw complaints from the British at Versailles. Mirepoix gained the Duke of Lorraine's permission to marry in August 1738. In October 1738, Mirepoix had received permission from Louis XV to marry. They were still awaiting word from the Prince de Cron, however, but the correspondence of others indicates that the marriage was ultimately arranged around this time. His fiancée's increased amiable correspondence with O'Rourke and her anticipated arrival in Vienna would, in O'Rourke's words, doubtless authorize a more intimate familiarity, which, which both he and James were hopeful of. Mirepoix treated O'Rourke with great civility and invited him to dinner on numerous occasions. The ambassador would uh, inform O'Rourke of his belief that following the eventual death of one of Louis's ministers, he would refer 
back to the use of four ministers of state at Versailles. And he also informs O'Rourke of the dissatisfaction of Versailles with the court of Spain. Anyone familiar with the correspondence of Madame Graffini will have found numerous references to this marriage and the family of the bride. The gossip of Madame Graffini recounts that Madame de Lixan was anxious about her marriage, reportedly stating that her fiance was a jealous and haughty man while she was a dissipated coquette. She did not expect the marriage to last four years. By November 1738, rumor appears to have been abounding that the marriage was off the cards and that Mirepoix had become extremely defensive and that he was in love with a rich widow in Vienna named Madame de Altheim. Mirepoix's response was that she was in love with him and not vice versa. The Princesse de Lixan and Mirepoix were married by proxy in autumn 1738, with the bride receiving a dowry of 30,000 livres from the Duke of Lorraine and an additional donation of 10,000 livres. In early January 1739, Mirepoix departed Vienna for Nancy, where he formally married Madame de Lixan in Louisville, and then journeyed to Versailles. Here he met Louis XV, who asked him whether he trembled when he spoke with the emperor in Vienna, to which Mirepoix responded that as a Frenchman, he trembled before no one save the king of France. He then returned to Vienna with his new bride. The boldness of Mirepoix's tone is corroborated by a letter from the British envoy in April 1739, which details that the Marquis was haughty over ceremonial matters and offended at having to stand at the Empress's table while her daughter sat. Therefore, he forbade his wife from attending on the Empress and as a result, offended all of the court in Vienna. As a part of the extended Cron family, Mirepoix recommended Stanville's eldest son to Versailles. Monsieur Marquis de Stanville has to leave for Paris these days. He even took his son with him to enter the king's service. This young man has made the last campaign after Prince Charles. I'm a relative and friend of Monsieur de Stanville. I would be much obliged to you, sir, if you would let him know that I have had the honor of writing to his son, and that son was Choiseul, who became Louis XIV, one of Louis XIV's very important ministers. Mirepoix would also be involved in additional matters related to O'Rourke, which had been unfolding in Vienna since 1738. In 1727, when O'Rourke first came to Vienna, he had conferred with the Saxon envoy regarding the estate of James's father-in-law, Prince James Sobieski, in Olau, Silesia. James had married Sobieski's daughter, Maria Clementina, in 1719. Sobieski had intended for the inheritance to be willed to James's sons, Charles Edward and Henry Benedict. However, since the death of Clementina in 1735, Sobieski's surviving child, Maria Carolina, Duchess of Bouillon, whom he had disinherited following her marriage to the Duke of Bouillon in 1724, had been attempting to re-establish relations with her father and secure inheritance for both herself and her children. O'Rourke was informed that the estate was so indebted that whomsoever succeeded Sobieski as his heir would not be much better off. Examining the case of this Sovieski inheritance has some benefits. Firstly, it again highlights the work of O'Rourke in serving and representing James Stewart, but also it highlights the interesting role played by Mirepoix and the French court of Versailles in these proceedings. Sobieski died on 19th December 1757. Earlier in the year, in February, he had bequeathed his grandson's 400,000 florins due him from Poland in addition to the Polish crown jewels that had been pledged to the Sobieskis in exchange for a loan. O'Rourke, notified by Passionet, the papal nuncio, informed James of this on 18th of January, 1738. James, however, already knew of Sobieski's demise and had written to O'Rourke the previous day, expressing concern that his children would not inherit, would not inherit much due to the prince's disorderly affairs. Nonetheless, he ordered O'Rourke to communicate to him all the steps he would take in Vienna regarding the settlement of the affair, and to similarly inform James of what was to be done in Rome. 
Sobieski had re written and rewritten his last will and testament several times, hoping to regulate his property so that it would be inherited by his Stuart grandsons, though the Stuarts themselves believed that the inheritance should be divided between all of the prince's grandchildren. The final will before Sobieski's death on 19th December stated that his belongings in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth would go to the Duchess of Bouillon's daughter, provided she married in Poland, while his possessions in Silesia, the 400,000 florins raised as security, and the Polish crown jewels were to go to the Stuart princes. Pachanet had been informed of Sobieski's death and the Duchess of Bouillon's activities by his counterpart in Dresden. O'Rourke suggested Passionet send someone to find out what approaches the Duchess was making. Gundakar von Starenberg, the Hofkammer president in Vienna, informed them that she had not made any overtures on their side, in addition to their not having a copy of Sobieski's final will, though the rumor was that Sobieski had made a change regarding the Stuart princes. Finding Sobieski's will proved difficult. Initially, James believed that there had been no will, considering that his sister-in-law was making no reference to it. However, he also believed that until Sobieski's final intentions were known, he couldn't press his children's claim. Therefore, while the Duchess searched Olau for the final will, James began to believe that no such document existed and that she had been excluded from the last known testament. However, no decisions would be made in Vienna regarding the inheritance until Sobieski's final disposition had been, was known. Passionet was replaced as nuncio in Vienna, having been appointed a cardinal priest. O'Rourke wrote that he would not miss him, commenting that Passionet had never shown him much courtesy or friendship. Passionet's replacement was Camillo Paolucci, formerly the nuncio in Dresden. Paolucci impressed O'Rourke more than Passionet, and he informed James that he was a discreet, sober man fit to be trusted. However, the new nuncio would not have orders until the summer. Nonetheless, Paolucci did what he could. When he arrived in June 1738, he agreed that the Olau Fund, worth 400,000 florins that had accumulated under Sobieski's name, would be best served handed over to the Pope. While attempting to know what the Austrian approach to the case was, Starenberg told Paolucci, Paolucci that he would need to confer with Philip Kinski, the Chancellor of Bohemia, before giving an answer, and O'Rourke guessed that the issue would be discussed in Austrian conferences. By the end of September, Starenberg informed him that he had not yet spoken of the affair to Emperor Charles VI, and had still not done so in December, instead advising that they continue to approach Kinski. In order to transfer the rights of the Duchy of Olau to the Pope, a contract between the Emperor Charles VI and Sobieski would need to be found. While Kinski promised to find the original, James learned that only a copy would be needed, much to O'Rourke's relief. To transfer the fund, the Emperor's approval would be needed. In October, Paolucci had an audience with the Emperor and reported to O'Rourke that Charles had stated he would oversee the affair in a proper manner. In Christmas of 1738, O'Rourke notified James that Kinski had spoken with Charles VI and that the chamber had been informed of the emperor's acknowledgement of the nuncio's mission. Kinski had initially appeared, according to Paolucci, to be in favor of the Duchess de Bouillon, though the latter's opinion changed in the new year. In September 1739, when the Duchess attempted to visit Olau, the Bohemian Chancellor's response was to order that she should not be allowed to dispose of anything there. However, Kinski's promise to comply with the nuncio's request for possession and payment soon fell to the wayside when he suggested that the nuncio make an affable settlement with the Duchess. Then, in January 1740, in the midst of this affair, Mirepoix was ordered to support the pretensions of the Duchess of Bouillon in Vienna. French ambassadors had been ordered to intervene in Sovietsky affairs before, in 1737, the Duke of Bouillon had received support to attempt to stop Sobieski marrying off his daughter without his permission in Poland. When Mirepoix received his orders, he first informed the nuncio, who now informed Rome that the French ambassador had been ordered to attend to the interests of the Duchess. 
the nuncio in turn arranged for Mayor Pau to disclose this information to O'Rourke as the latter's good friend and as the uncle to his wife. As to Mayor Pau, he was apparently no great lover of the Bouillons and it was expected that he would not pursue their interests with much vigor. O'Rourke called often to the French embassy, but Mayor Pau made no mention of his orders regarding Bouillon and put off answering any queries regarding those orders. The intercession of the French crown led O'Rourke to write to Daniel O'Brien, James's agent in Paris, who subsequently shared the following letter with Cardinal Fleury at Versailles. We have re relied entirely here on the just assurances that it had pleased his eminence, Cardinal Fleury and Monsieur Amelot, to give to the apostolic nuncio and to you, sir, that the intention of the king in recommending to the imperial court the interests of the Duchess of Guyon was not to harm the just rights of our princes. We flattered ourselves on the admonitions given in this respect to her eminence and on the promise she was kind enough to give that she would write a second letter to Monsieur de Mirepoix to mitigate this first recommendation and to avoid at least that by a blind deference of this court to that of France, the real and recognized rights of the princes of England should be sacrificed to Madame de Bouillon or her children. This is, however, what seems to be happening solely by, by the power of the solicitations used against them. It may be that in the multiplicity of the great affairs with which his eminence is occupied, he will have forgotten to instruct Monsieur de Mirepoix to limit his recommendation to the terms of equity. I am convinced that on the slightest reflection that Cardinal Fleury will be able to make with this procedure, he will be willing to divert the bad effects by a suitable explanation to Monsieur de Mirepoix because after all, it must be agreed that Messrs de Bouillon must not, nor can they demand in their favor that which is compatible with honor, justice, and religion. And if our princes cannot hope for perfect neutrality, I hope at least that we will be strong enough that their interests, which are so clear, are not suffocated by an absolute intercession that would certainly have its full effect on their prejudice. The same day as O'Brien communicated this letter, directions from Versailles were then forwarded to Mirepoix, ordering him to observe neutrality, neutrality in this case. Mirepoix's correspondence with Versailles does not give much of an indication as to his own personal position during these events. He stated that he would comply with the orders once the Duke of Guillaume's agent contacted him. However, he met this agent only once at the end of Lent and two days before a ruling on the estate was due from the chancellery. Looking to claim Mirepoix's good offices, he was told that he could only use the king's name to speed up a decision. When Mirepoix wrote that he was already feeling the consequences of the original order without having carried it out for fear of risking his particular inclinations, one might suspect that he was alluding to his relationship with the husband of his wife's aunt, O'Rourke. As for Ola itself, on 12th March, following long delays and requests of patience from Kinsky, O'Rourke was able to inform James that the Bohemian Chancery had issued a decree for possession of the all out fund, subject to the Emperor's approval. This approval was not initially forthcoming, delayed by the Emperor's Easter devotions and ceremonial duties, and the Nuncio's unwillingness to broach the issue. The delays continued as the Emperor ventured to his summer residency in Luxembourg and Paolucci continued to rely on Kinsky's assurances. O'Rourke wrote of his belief that Kinsky was purposely delaying and preventing any action as a means of soliciting the attention of King George II, although James expressed his disbelief at such a move. O'Rourke wrote that it was true that the emperor had submitted a referral on the matter to the necessary bureau, and that Kinsky had called several times to collect but the minister in charge had been unable to find the referral. It eventually emerged, much to the nuncio's rage, that the emperor had not even seen the document. When a decree was finally forthcoming from the Austrian side, it stated that paying the servants in all out would be improper. A certain amount of legal time for the Bouillons should be granted so as not to give way to a lawsuit, and the stewards should pay the costs of Sobieski's funeral. It was decided then to write a new memorial with the aim of having these decrees redressed. Emperor Charles VI died on 20th October 1740 in the midst of these activities. And in the fallout of this, any further developments were delayed. 
James, as James feared, matters such as Bavarian pretensions to claim the title of emperor from the Habsburgs and Prussian mobilization on, the borders, on their borders would all contribute further to the affair being made dormant in successive weeks. Duchess of Bouillon died in May 1740. Kinski then informs the nuncio, all the better for you, for her children are foreign in this country. As the Duchess's illness had been known, O'Rourke had guessed that had the Austrians known in advance what she, that she was in a critical condition, they would have improved her claim as co heiress and in all the donation made on the Stuart side in order to claim the money for their own. Her children being French, they would have fallen victim to Austria's laws which targeted French inhabitants in the Habsburg lands. Prussia's invasion of Silesia in December 1740 looked certain to exasperate the Stuart claim to the actual estate. Although not this far side of it, or work informs James, will probably become a prey to those invaders. Although was in Prussian hands by January 1741, when news that King Frederick the Great of Prussia had already granted the estate to one of his own officers. The nuncio sent word to O'Rourke that the Austrians would not provide any money for the Olau Fund in the Bank of Vienna for the benefit of their servants. Although James saw himself under no obligation to pay them unless given possession of the, of the estate, he was, affair that he was aware that those poor people must be paid and O'Rourke was ordered to see to their finances once Olau was gained. In March 1741, Paolucci had had an audience with Charles VI's heir and successor, Maria Theresa, concerning withdrawing money from the fund for the servants. It would not be until J July 1741 that Paolucci reported to Rome his having procured the money from Starenburg for the servants. Olau, however, would be lost to the Stuart princes, but the crown jewels that, that were being kept in Rome would not. However, the jewels themselves could not be touched for 50 years in the event that the Polish crown wanted them back. And I think on that note, I will stop. Thank you. <laughs>